and a very warm welcome to Middle East Matters. I'm Sanam Shantier. Coming up on our program this week, a refugee camp for the widows and orphans of Syria's decade-long war. It may be a safe haven, but stories of hope are hard to come by. One woman's fight for Iraq's Yazidi community will be speaking to Nobel Peace Prize laureate Nadia Murad. Also coming up on our program this week, Jordan's Minister of Health steps down this amid a deadly scandal concerning a hospital in Amman that has run out of oxygen. Now, since the start of Syria's decade-long conflict, some 1.5 million refugees have fled to neighboring Lebanon, many of them sheltered in camps along the border. France 24's reporters traveled to one of these camps, a gated community where women, widowed by the war, are struggling to raise their children. James Andre has this report. In Arsal, an immense tarpaulin city shelters Lebanon's largest group of Syrian refugees. One of the camps is set aside, walled and gated. There are no men here. We call it the widow and orphan camp. We live alone here. Our husbands are all with God. These women prefer to remain discreet about how their husbands died. Some disappeared in Syrian prisons, others fought with militia. Suad arrived here in 2014 with four of her children. Her husband stayed in Syria. He is dead. I only have two children left, a girl and a boy. I had five. One was killed. I married two. My husband is dead. When I arrived here, we were a family of seven. All I have left is two children. It's awful. These widows chose to regroup in this informal camp. Visits are allowed in the daytime. Men aren't allowed in the camp after 9 p.m. We are happy because we don't want to live in a mixed camp. How can I put it? Society is ruthless to us. All we want is to raise our children. We don't take notice of those outside criticizing us. The only man allowed to live in the camp is the shawish, the guard. He collects rent, 25,000 Lebanese pounds per tent and per month, currently around three euro. He makes sure things go smoothly. They are women living together who have an understanding. I only intervene when there's a big problem. To them, I'm a fatherly figure. The widows survive doing odd jobs. They get a UNHCR monthly allowance of 100,000 Lebanese pounds per person, currently around 10 euros. Not enough to make ends meet. I'm in debt and I have to raise four orphans with no financial support. I have been here for 10 years, since the beginning of the conflict. Look at my son. He was four months old when his father died. We are all hoping for a miracle, but the truth is we are all going to die here waiting for a solution. The school is closed due to the coronavirus pandemic. In these camps, children are forced to grow up quickly, especially girls. We're going to marry Basma next year because of our tough situation. <laughs> that is our daughter's destiny because we are refugees. They have no alternative. So it's all our daughters think about, and that's all we think about. At 14, 15, 16 years old maximum, they must be living with their husbands. None of my friends think I should do it. They all say, don't get married. I really want her to get a husband. I have married off her two older sisters. They were 14. Now they each have three or four children. Most of the women we have spoken to tell us they are ready to return to Syria, though they are afraid. And what they are hoping for is some form of international protection for themselves and their children. Now, this week on Middle East Matters, I'm joined by Nadia Murad, a recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. Back in 2014, as a member of the Yazidi community, she was enslaved and raped by the Islamic State group. Several of her brothers were also brutally murdered at the hands of the militants. Now, although Nadia escaped her captors and is a free woman today, her relentless fight for justice for victims of IS continues, and her voice 
continues to reverberate. So much so that Pope Francis said he was inspired to visit Iraq after reading her book, The Incredible, The Last Girl. Nadia, thank you so much for speaking to us on Middle East Matters. Of course, thank you for having me. Now, you have been a prominent voice bringing the Yazidi message to the world, but there are also many women from the community who are concealing their identity. Do you think it's also important for them to speak out, to draw more attention to this cause? Well, you know, um, many Yazidi women bravely brought their, their stories and their, their messages uh, to the world. And uh, they, they told and, and were retelling their, their stories. Uh, we have testified uh, our trauma for, for reporters and uh, NGOs, uh, government officials, and the, the UNITAD team. And in addition to everything uh, they have uh, endured, uh, survivors should not have uh, to, to bear the, the burden of continually uh, reliving experiences of, of sexual violence. Uh, stories have been collected and it is the responsibility of, of the international community to act on, on this evidence and, and pursue meaningful justice. You're absolutely right. And I do want to talk about them. I want to shift the attention to Yazidi women who were forced to give up their babies that they had while sexually enslaved by their captors. And what's really shocking is that to date, very few of them have been reunited. I have had uh, discussions uh, with, the, with Yazidi religious uh, leaders uh, in about ways uh, to to uh, holistically uh, support and reintegrate uh, these women uh, uh, from uh, from uh, captivity, it is important to to understand the the root of of this issue uh, is the the rape perpetrated by ISIS. Uh, sexual violence against women was used as a weapon of war. And Nadia, some steps have been taken. We know that the Iraqi government has enacted this landmark bill to formally recognize the violence against the Yazidis as genocide. Is that enough, in your opinion, or is that just the first step? This step was important. Uh, the long overdue Yazidi female survivors law is uh, historic because it formally acknowledged the, the Yazidi genocide and, and sexual violence against uh, women, but progress is is not a photo op and and an empty promise. Uh, what is important now is that the law is swiftly and comprehensively implemented. The implementation of this law could provide meaningful change, but the suffering of the Yazidi community will not end there. Now that we have like tens of, of mass graves in, in Sinjar that needs to be open. Uh, ISIS members still walk free. Regional actors uh, comp compromise uh, Sinjar's security. And so many women and, and children are still missing in captivity. And that's horrific. And that, that's the question for you. You said a photo op is not enough, and rightly so. What can we do to empower this community, which, as you mentioned, has been subjected to violence, to genocide, and of course, whose future is still very much uncertain? Well, nearly like it's, it's, it's been uh, seven years and still there's so much more work to be, to be done. And I think it, it boils down to, to a collective and holistic pursuit of justice. Justice in the legal system by holding ISIS accountable for, for crimes of genocide and sexual violence. Justice through enabling a dignified return to the Yazidi homeland. Justice by investing in basic services like healthcare, uh, education, clean water, and livelihood opportunities in, in Sinjar, uh, justice through uh, pro pro prioritizing the, the safety and security of, of Sinjar's uh, communities and, and preventing future genocide. 
And of course, that pursuit for justice continues. Nadia Murad, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us on Middle East Matters on this important issue. Thank you. Turning our attention now to Jordan, where protests have been erupting over a major hospital running out of oxygen, which led to the death of seven COVID-19 patients. As Claire Rush reports, the Kingdom's Minister of Health has resigned amid growing anger and calls for an investigation. Furious crowds gather outside this hospital in the Jordanian city of Salt, where at least seven COVID patients died after the facility ran out of oxygen. The deaths have angered residents and health workers alike. We hope that someone will be held accountable for what has happened. God willing, all those responsible will be held accountable. The most pressing issue here is that patients are suffering more and are being denied their right to full medical treatment. We demand to separate coronavirus patients from normal patients. Visiting the site on Saturday, King Abdullah was filmed during an angry exchange with the director of the hospital, who has since been arrested along with four other officials. The public outcry over the deaths has led to the resignation of the kingdom's health minister. The head of the region's local health service has also been suspended, pending the outcome of an investigation ordered by the prime minister. What happened was a great mistake, unjustifiable and unacceptable. In fact, I feel ashamed about it, and the government feels ashamed about what happened. We will not try to justify or belittle what happened or accept this mistake, and we bear full responsibility. Jordan began its coronavirus vaccination campaign in January, but has so far only inoculated a tiny fraction of its 10 million residents. It's recorded almost half a million cases and nearly 5,500 deaths since the start of the pandemic. The kingdom has seen a surge in cases in recent weeks, prompting authorities to reimpose restrictions, including an all-day curfew on Fridays, the National Day of Rest. Well, that's it from us on Middle East Matters this week. You can always reach out to us on Twitter or Facebook. Thank you for watching.